Why would I be talking about myasthenia gravis? Condition that very few people even think about, much less know anything about. Well, it really started because somebody asked me the question about what is happening with myasthenia gravis? And I didn't have an answer, but I have access to over 10 years of data looking at admission statistics. And so what I did is I then decided to take a look at that. And what I found was astonishing. So the first thing you have to wonder about is what really is myasthenia gravis? And so what I've done is that this is from the NHS. This is an overview of the condition. And it's a rare long-term condition that causes muscle weakness, okay? It commonly affects the muscles that control the eyes, eyelids, and facial expressions. Also chewing and swallowing and speaking. But it can be any part of the body. It can affect people of any age, typically in women under 40 and men over 60. That's important when we're talking about what comes next. The main thing is that people will have droopy eyelids. They may have double vision problems with making facial expression, their speech may be slurred, sometimes it'll get shortness of breath. So there are, there are a number of, of issues that go on with it, and it is a significant condition, but it is treatable. So we can use medication to manage it, but not cure it. So I'll give you some slides now so that you understand the background as to what was going on. And I'll then show you some of the data that I found since the pandemic started, because this is really my question overall, is what has changed since the pandemic? Now, if you know what I've been talking about for years, I've been talking about the spike protein driving autoimmune responses. So I expect autoimmune diseases to rise. This is no surprise to me. And this is why this fits within the paradigm that I've been talking about. And once you understand the paradigm, everything makes sense. And you can predict the future almost as to what is going to happen next. My concern is that if we don't not only predict the future, but try and mitigate it by identifying who is going to be affected with some of these conditions, that is going to bring about a long-term health disaster. But that's just my opinion. And I can't yet force anybody in the scientific community to think along my lines. Here is an overview of a normal neuromuscular junction. So what you have to understand is that the muscles that you have all over the body are connected by nerves from the brain and spinal cord. And this is how you move. Normally, in the neuronal impulse in this neuromuscular junction, when the signal comes, it releases acetylcholine. This then causes these, um, these receptors to open up the sodium channels. This then triggers an electrical signal and the muscle moves. And so this is a very important aspect of movement. It's the nerves connected to the muscles and it uses a beautiful beautifully controlled chemical signal with the electrical signal in order to transfer information. Beautiful. What happens in myasthenia gravis is this. What you then have is the acetylcholine is still produced, but autoantibodies, and an autoantibody is an antibody that targets a normal protein. And so these autoantibodies bind to these receptors and degrade them. So when the acetylcholine is released, there are not enough of them around. And so there is less muscle contraction, not necessarily no muscle contraction. And that's why people can get droopy eyelids towards, say, the end of the day, because your eyelids are continuously activating all the time. This is what keeps your eyelids open. And then by the end of the day, as it's becoming more tired, you would then find if somebody had a condition like myasthenia gravis, they would start to have drooping of their eyelids. That's a good early indicator of the condition. And it's all because of this damage to the receptors 
because of autoimmune responses, okay? And this is what it looks like side by side. Normally, acetylcholine is released, triggers the, um, the electrical signal. In myasthenia gravis on this side, the acetylcholine is still released, but because these are degraded or blocked, the signal is much weaker, and so therefore you have less muscle movement. So as I said, it's a significant condition and not one that we should take lightly. So why am I focused on it now, as I said, in terms of the numbers? And how do I explain what is happening? Now, remember, this is my explanation based around my paradigm of autoimmune responses related to the spike protein. So you may argue that, well, there are other people who think differently. That's fine. I'm just explaining to you, based on this autoimmune paradigm, what I expect to happen and why. So let's follow along. Here is the thymus. Now, it's literally sitting right behind your sternum in your chest. And it's a very important organ, especially when you're younger. And this is just a cross-section of it inside the medulla cortex and then it has a capsule and it's like the university for T cells. It's a fascinating system that your body has with regards to immune training. The T cells are produced in the bone marrow but they are not functional until they've gone to thymus university. That's where they are selected and only a small fraction of them are selected to make sure that they can go on to have lifelong immune responses in some cases. So it's a very sophisticated selection process. And once it's done, you then have a well-trained immune cell that knows to target the correct things in the body. One of the fascinating things that occurred in the COVID pandemic was that we saw a significant amount of damage to this thymus. So pre-COVID, you would have found this after the person was infected, the thymus shrinks significantly. We don't know fully the mechanism for this. We know it happens, but it's unclear exactly why. And maybe this could be linked to the lymphopenia, low lymphocyte counts that comes with COVID. We're not sure but it is a significant finding in terms of what happens next. So I have in the description a presentation on immune privilege, and it's because of this important point. Here is one of the points I've made about inflammation, especially in long COVID, that part of the problem is that if there's an inflammatory process that's ongoing, normally it's kept in check by these T regulatory cells. And these are very importantly trained in the thymus. If you have less of them, or if they become damaged, inflammation increases, not because the inflammation got worse, but just because the suppression or the peacemaking cells, there are less of them. So you end up with more fighting, more inflammation, more war. And that's the essence of what I think happens around damage to T-regulatory cells and also damage to the thymus. This is an important part of the picture because there are two phases with regards to myasthenia gravis, usually younger patients, and that's female mostly, and then older patients over 60 tend to be more male. And one interesting thing is in younger patients, you can remove the thymus to improve the symptoms. And that's because the thymus is overactive, producing lots of autoantibodies or improperly trained T cells. On the other hand, if someone is older with myasthenia gravis, it doesn't help to take out the thymus because in fact, at that stage, they probably need more regulatory cells to keep their immune system in balance. That's an important point because you will see the relevance in it in terms of this post-pandemic period. Here is what happened in terms of percentage change between 2016-17 to 2024-25. In the younger age groups, 
there was a fall in the number of cases. Now, remember what I said about the thymus being damaged and shrunk. So if somebody was at risk, it would make sense in a younger age group that if there was damage to the thymus and they were at risk for myasthenia gravis, it's kind of like taking out the thymus. And so therefore, that would fit that you would have lower risk in younger age groups. Then when you look back at the older age groups, you can see here that the risk was highest in the 60 to 79 um, year old. This was an 82.9% rise between 2016 to 2017 and 2024 to 2025. So this is huge. Now, we have to take it into context because as you look at all of these, all of these are rising. And you have to remember that the incidence or the frequency was rising anyway pre-pandemic. So that's important because some people will say, well, it was rising anyway, so what's the big deal if it's rising post-pandemic? As I said, it was rising across all age groups, and so we know something has changed because we can see in the younger age group there is a fall. So something has changed. The question is what and why? When we look again at admission numbers, and you can see now, Admission numbers are not necessarily all the numbers because if somebody had mild myasthenia, they wouldn't need to be in hospital, but it is still an important trend to try and understand. So when we look at the actual numbers, so in 2016-17, there are only 355 that year, and in 2024-25, it was 310. That's the reduction in terms of that period of time. Then you have the different age groups here, 20 to 39. You can see this was rising anyway, bigger rise. Same 40 to 50, um, 59, rising, biggish rise, not as much. But when you look at the over 60, you can see that this here was a very significant rise in terms of the 24, 25 uh, period. So overall, as I said, the trend was rising pre-pandemic, but there was an even bigger rise at this point. Now, you have to take into consideration that a high number of people died in the pandemic. And so what you would expect, because most likely they were in older cohorts, vulnerable with comorbidities, you would expect, therefore, if those people died, you should have either leveling out or a decrease in cases. So the increase is not just an increase in a normal population. It is an increase in a population where a significant proportion of older people with comorbidities who may have been at risk already died. So this rise is even more significant when we consider the fact that this age group, 60 to 79, had lost a significant number in the COVID pandemic. So this rise, when you add that into consideration, is absolutely huge, in my estimation. Now, again, some people may think that this is not so significant. Well, all I can say is this. This is just the beginning of this kind of breakdown. Because my question has been recently, what has changed and why? It's an important question. Because what I expect, and this is now me adding the extrapolation on it, what I expect is happening is that if we looked in more detail, I believe, without having any clear evidence, if we broke it down by vaccination status, based on my extrapolation of spike protein autoimmune responses, I would expect this to be higher in vaccinated cohorts higher risk of autoimmune responses, and the fact is that there seems to be a higher risk of reinfections, especially mild reinfections, where people barely know that they've been infected simply because of IgG4, and every time you have virus breaking through the immune system, knocking on the thymus, shrinking it further, 
When you think about that in older cohorts, you can then see why if the thymus autoimmune protection is removed, not just myasthenia gravis, but you will expect many other autoimmune conditions to increase in the same trajectory. That's what I expect to find based on that science. Let me repeat it. My science is a simple extrapolation. Spike protein drives autoimmune responses, whatever the source. When you also have spike protein driving autoimmune responses and a poor ability to block the virus from breaking through the mucosal barrier and getting into the bloodstream, you are having a double, triple, quadruple whammy of exposure to spike protein from multiple sources. Based on that extrapolation, I would expect these cases to rise. My view is simple. At this point, your most important job is to reduce the systemic exposure to spike protein. I'm not so concerned if spike protein gets in someone's upper airway because I don't think you can prevent that easily, even with masking. But what you don't want is this virus or spike protein breaking into the systemic circulation, circulating around in the bloodstream and doing damage. One of the simplest ways that I do every day is I hum, making sure that I'm improving the function and the effectiveness of my mucosal immunity in the upper airways, simple humming. This book in the description below, you can get a free black and white copy or you can get the full book to support us in the sense, share it with someone else. It is one of the simplest things you can do to raise awareness and to add that extra protection. Because believe me, whatever your vaccination status is, we are all at risk. It's just to varying degrees. Whatever you can do to protect yourself is very important. Thank you for listening and have a great evening. A hero, an immune adventure. Humming Heroes, your lyrical guide to the body's defenders. Now on Amazon. Check the links below.